now that we've talked a little bit about control of microbes in our environment and in hosts, Chapter 15 will deal with how are the microbes going to evade our natural defenses. And that's what's meant by the mechanisms of pathogenicity. Pathogenicity is the capacity of a microbe or other infectious agent to cause illness. Virulence is how strong can they do that? How much damage do they do? So we're going to be looking at the ways that different microbes can cause disruption in the host, cause illness. We're going to be talking about signs and symptoms. And signs are features that can be measured. Things like a temperature can be measured. That would be a sign, a heart rate would be a sign. Blood pressure is a sign. Uh, blood panel chemistry would be a sign. Sneezing, coughing, things that can be observed and measured. Symptoms are definitive things that are felt by the patient but can't really be objectively measured. So nausea would be a symptom. You can definitely for yourself determine if you're not very nauseated or extremely nauseated, but there's not a way to actually measure and quantify that. And lots of diseases can produce similar signs and symptoms, and that's why it can be very difficult to get a definitive diagnosis without a lot of testing. This slide shows us the differences and similarities between some respiratory ailments, allergies versus the cold versus influenza, which is cause, cause of the flu, versus the coronavirus, which causes COVID-19. These are all things that cause disruption with our respiratory system primarily. They get into us via a respiratory pathway. And without reading you the entire slide, we can see that particularly between influenza and coronavirus, there's an awful lot of overlap between uh, signs and symptoms that are the same. Cough is the same. Fatigue, fever chills, shaking. And then other things are sometimes with coronavirus and often with flu or often with the, well, often with the flu and sometimes with coronavirus or even rare. With early symptoms or mild symptoms for either, it could be really difficult to determine which illness one has, which is why it's important if one isn't feeling well at all, it's important to isolate away from others so that you don't spread the illness. This is showing blood smears with two very different types of ailments. On the left, we have malaria caused by a protist, which is a eukaryotic microbe. Plasmodium falciparum is the microbe that's stained. The others are the red blood cells. On this side, we also have red blood cells. This is a white blood cell. And this little crescent is still a red blood cell. It's called a sickle cell. This is not due to a microbe infecting the person. This is a genetic illness. So that would not be pathogenesis because it's not a illness caused by a microbe, but it would be if a person is suffering symptoms, they might need to do a blood smear to determine is it due to the presence of a pathogen or is it because of a genetic ailment. We saw a microbial growth curve with the various common stages of microbial growth from lag, log, stationary, and death phase. This is not indicating particular numbers of microbes, and the time is also relative. This is showing the stages of disease, and we're typically talking about infectious disease here. The periods, we have the incubation where the microbe is present, but the person may be feeling no signs or symptoms. 
prodromal means we're starting to feel not right. Period of illness is what it sounds like. You definitively feel like you have something wrong with you. The decline doesn't mean of the patient. It means of the signs and symptoms. And then convalescence is the recovery. The uh, red line is indicating the number of pathogens. There's not a scale here simply because it depends widely what the pathogen is. If a few of them will cause the illness or does it take millions of them to cause the illness? Likewise, the severity of the symptoms, we don't really have it. Symptoms are not measurable, so you might feel extreme headache and somebody else might consider that a moderate headache, but it's just the degree to which the patient reports feeling the symptoms. Time is not indicated because some illnesses have hours of incubation, some have days, some have weeks, some have months. But this overall pattern is the same, that as the number of particles increase, the signs and symptoms do, and as the particles decrease due to medical intervention and due to your immune system kicking in, then of course the signs and symptoms also decrease. This series of experiments was initially done by Dr. Koch, and now what they come up to is called Koch's postulates. To postulate something means to propose that this is the way you think it works. And Koch's postulates were used to show that a given disease was caused by a specific pathogen. And the steps were, unfortunately, once again, the poor mice. You have a little healthy organism and we can look at its red blood cells and it's a nice healthy organism. And we can just look to see if there's any pathogens in its blood or tissues. If there was an or a little mousy who had some illness, they would look for the microbe in the blooded tissues and they would find one that is not present in any healthy animal, but that pathogen, that organism that was seen on the slide was present in all cases of the diseased organisms. And once you find that organism, you can actually use your loop, touch it to that slide and pick it up, streak it onto auger to get isolated colonies. You would do that a few times to make sure it's a pure culture. Once you have a pure culture where only one organism is present, then sadly that pure culture is grown up and injected into the mouse, poor mousy croaks, and then re-isolate that microbe from the deceased animal, put it into a healthy animal and it should kill it again, and re-isolate that exact same pathogen. This does work very well in animal models where the animal is susceptible to the disease, if it's an animal disease. If it's a human disease, you have to find an animal model where the illness affects the animal in the same way that it affects people in order for it to be a valid test. At the bottom I have that there are alternatives to Koch's postulates, like detecting microbial DNA using the polymerase chain reaction. And that's because it's not always possible to isolate the microbe and streak it onto auger to get isolated colonies. That's true for a few types of bacterial species. The organism that causes syphilis is a Treponema pallidum. We can't grow that on auger. So you can't really isolate it in pure culture and then re-inject it and prove that's it. But that organism in a blood sample is present in every single case, and now we can do PCR to detect that. Viral diseases cannot be done easily with Koch's postulates because we can't streak viruses on agar. They have to be grown inside cells, and once you do that, you do not have a pure culture. You have eukaryotic cells 
and viruses. So Koch's postulates are not the only way to definitively connect a pathogen with an illness. They were the original way, and they still can be used, but there are other ways that might be necessary. This graph shows us the LD50, that stands for the lethal dose 50. That's the dose that will kill 50% of those that are exposed. So this is showing the number of pathogenic agents, which are either cells or viruses, that were exposed to a varying number of individuals, probably mice or rats, and the percent mortality in that experimental group. There were, of course, controls that were injected with pure saline so that those animals should have a 0% death rate. And for this particular pathogen, whatever it is, 10 to the 4th or 10,000 cells or virions caused half of the population that were injected to die. That's the LD50. So the lower the number of an LD50, the more virulent that pathogen is the more easily it can cause a serious illness. This is the infectious dose 50. So the LD50 will show how many will be killed. An infectious dose 50 would be how many pathogens have to be necessary to cause illness in 50%. So illness in 50% is not the same as death in 50%. I don't believe there's a disease that has 100% mortality every single time. Rabies was up there because untreated, it pretty much kills you every time. There's some minor treatments now. But the infectious dose 50 just means how many particles, whether it's microbial or viral, that cause illness in half the population. The LD50 is how many particles or cells are necessary to kill half the population. These two uh, fantastic specimens are showing us the portals of entry. What are the different ways that pathogens can get into us? Because as we'll see in our chapters on the immune system, we have some pretty good barriers aside from our interior antibodies and T cells, just our exterior bodies are pretty good at preventing infection. But pathogens can get in through our eyes, nose, and mouth, uh, the vagina and persons that have it, the anus, the urethra, insect bites, needles, broken skin. You probably could have figured those out without this image. But it does show that it has to be some way of bypassing our intact skin. That is how the microbes get in. And of course, in pregnant people, through the placenta, the uh, microbes can pass from the, the mother to the fetus. The interior of the uh, uterus is sterile. And so there wouldn't be any microbes going from the fetus to the mother, but they can go from the mother to the fetus. We've seen biofilms when we talked about quorum sensing and the ability of bacteria to send signals to their buddies once they get in a high enough population and can then, with high numbers, not only stick to host tissues or medical devices, but then also secrete chemicals that allow them to invade into deeper tissues. And in this case, what's allowing them to stick is the glycocalyx, the capsule. So glyco means sugar or polysaccharide, and calyx is a covering. So it's the sugar covering. That's the capsule. This slide is showing Helicobacter pylori. It's called Helicobacter because it kind of spins like a helicopter. It has these little flagella. Pylori because it gets through our pyloric valve into our stomachs. The Helicobacter pylori contacts this nice mucin gel that is coating the interior of our stomachs. 
Our stomachs have epithelial cells, just like the lining of our respiratory tract, our digestive tract, our reproductive tract. But if there was no mucin gel, then our stomach acid would pretty much damage that tissue layer. So the mucin is what's protecting our stomach intestinal, uh, our stomach epithelial cells. But when this microbe contacts that mucin gel, then it releases urease. Urease is a chemical that we detected in exercise, I think it was 515. Urease releases urea and carbon dioxide, and that helps to neutralize the stomach acid. If the stomach acid is more neutral, that will allow the mucin to liquefy, and then the bacteria can swim through it and damage the epithelial cells spread from cell to cell, but also this damage caused to the mucin layer by the urease that neutralizes the stomach acid, still that acid is going to have a much lower pH than is healthy for the epithelial cells and can cause damage. The way pathogens leave our bodies is mostly through the ways they get in. So if they enter through the vagina, they typically exit through the vagina. Uh, if they enter through the urethra into the urinary system, they typically exit through the urethra. Uh, if it's a surface skin infection, flaking off skin cells will do that. If we receive some sort of infection that's bloodborne, an insect bite, that insect could pick up those microbes and give them to another. So feces can also uh, deliver microbes back to the environment, which is why proper sanitation and water treatment is important. Um, mammary glands can secrete pathogens, so breastfeeding can not only pass the good things like antibodies to breastfeeding infants, but could also pass pathogens to breastfeeding uh, infants. Needles that pick up the pathogen, if that was injected into someone else, could certainly uh, transfer a pathogen, which is why shared needles are so dangerous between persons that use injectable drugs. And then our nose and mouth from breathing and secretions can absolutely spread pathogens, sneezing, coughing, just wiping and touching a surface. Tears can spread it. By the end of the disease sections, I'll make you afraid of everything. This image is showing edema or fluid accumulation. This person has one hand that is experiencing edema. This is what their hand should look like. So the skin is swollen and tightened from the accumulation of the fluid. This happens because of the person's actual immune response to a pathogen. The pathogen didn't cause it directly, but the person's immune response releases inflammatory molecules that makes the blood vessel blood vessels more permeable and when the blood vessels are more permeable that not only recruits immune cells to that site that could fight off a possible infection but it also is what lets fluid water and lymph escape the bloodstream and enter into that tissue and cause the swelling so it's not necessarily great for us that we've uh, experience edema and this inflammation, but it is our body trying to fight the pathogen that triggered these inflammatory molecules. Looking at our connective tissue, having our tissues sealed up pretty tight together is a good way to try to prevent the spread of microbes. However, some microbes secrete enzymes that dissolve those connections. In our epidermis, we have hyaluronan, also called hyaluronic acid, that is cushioning our cells and protecting them. Bacteria that produce hyaluronidase digest that 
and make it easier for these bacteria to spread through that epidermis and get into deeper tissues. Collagen is another extracellular matrix uh, chemical and some microbes will produce collagen ACE, a chemical that enzyme that breaks down collagen. And when our connective tissue is broken down, that allows the microbes to spread from the exterior into the blood vessels and can become systemic. LPS is lipopolysaccharide. We were first introduced to this chemical way back when we started talking about prokaryotic cells and the differences between gram-positive and gram-negative. Gram-positive cells do have that thick multi-linked layers of peptidoglycan and gram-negative have very few layers, but the gram-negative in addition to that thin wall have a second outer membrane. And that outer membrane is composed of this lipopolysaccharide. Polysaccharide is a complex carbohydrate and lipo means there's a lipid. So we have this O antigen, which is the polysaccharide. We have, based on this image, triose and pentose and ooh, four sugar tetrahose sugars. The core, which means it's similar in all of the lipopolysaccharides, and then the lipid A. So we have two polar heads and the two tails per polar head making up the lipid A. So every gram negative will have the same lipid A and the same core short polysaccharide and the O antigen is what varies and is unique between each different organism. An antigen, we will go into great detail in our immune system chapters, but an antigen is something that generates an antibody response. Anything that irritates your immune system and causes your body to produce antibodies, that is an antigen. The lipid portion that is the same <clears throat> in all of our gram negatives is the toxic component. And that's what causes inflammation and fever. And so depending on what else is present, that lipid A might cause minor inflammation and fever or severe inflammation and fever. Another toxin is called AB toxins. This is a category of toxins. It is released by the organism that creates it. And it's called AB because there are two parts to this toxin. There is the B component is what binds this toxin to a host cell membrane. And the toxin is then brought in by the host cell membrane, and now it is in a vacuole. And the A component is the active component. It separates from the binding one and accesses the cytoplasm. And depending on the source of this AB toxin will cause different effects. Whatever that active portion is, that's what will affect the host. The B portion just brought it in. The A portion acts on the host and causes the difficulties. So one example of an AB toxin is cholera toxin. We will talk at length about that in the chapter on gastrointestinal diseases, but it is an AB toxin. So that is one way that a pathogen can get its ill effects inside the host. If you ingest the microbe that secretes this toxin, the toxin binds to a receptor on the cell. The receptor isn't designed to bind to cholera toxin, it is designed to bind to some useful chemical, but 
the B component takes advantage of that is shaped very similar to the molecule that this receptor is supposed to bind to. And that's what tricks the cell into bringing in the whole toxin, and then the active component is released to cause its effects. Diphtheria also secretes an AB toxin. The binding toxin is, portion is here, the active portion enters, and it acts by inhibiting protein synthesis of the host. That active subunit, if I can get myself out of the way, inactivates elongation factor 2. Elongation factor 2 is necessary for protein synthesis. The toxin blocks that from happening and the ribosome cannot proceed along the messenger RNA and we stop the protein synthesis. It results by killing cells in the throat of the person where this is happening and let's say this is blocked off but it says causes a sheet of dead skin to form in the back of the throat. It's called a pseudo membrane, a fake membrane because it is your own skin cells that peel off and form a sheet of skin that blocks your airway. That's why diphtheria was one of the first uh, diseases for which uh, widespread vaccination became available because it suffocates children to death. Uh, would certainly suffocate an adult as well, but it is a common childhood illness and it is very important to prevent that and its spread because it is spread by respiratory droplets. Botulism and tetanus toxins are grouped together because they both come from the genus of bacteria called Clostridium. It's Clostridium botulinum and Clostridium tetani. They are both obligate anaerobes. They cannot grow in the presence of oxygen. Botulism is contracted by ingesting the toxin and tetanus is contracted typically by puncture wounds. Probably heard of don't step on a rusty nail, you'll get tetanus. That's true. That is one way that it could happen, but any puncture wound. And a puncture wound is much more likely to transmit tetanus than a cut or a scrape because punctures pierce the skin and then the skin kind of seals up behind it. That's what creates the anaerobic environment that the tetanus needs to secrete its toxin. The botulism happens in improperly canned foods primarily. It can be in the soil. There's also infant botulism from eating raw honey. Both of them, even though they are either ingested or essentially injected by getting under the skin, have neurological effects. They secrete neuro toxins. In the case of botulism, it causes a flaccid paralysis, the inability to contract. And that happens because the toxin stops the release of acetylcholine. And without acetylcholine, you can't get muscle contraction. So flaccid paralysis uh, with infants that have eaten raw honey or ingested other foods that have botulism toxin in it. It's called floppy baby syndrome because they have zero muscle tone. And it's particularly dangerous because some very important things rely on muscle contraction like your heartbeat and breathing, your diaphragm being able to expand and contract. Tetanus causes the opposite. It causes stiff paralysis. Normally we have the acetylcholine release and you contract and when the acetylcholine goes away you can relax. With the tetanus toxin you continually get um, the acetylcholine present and we don't get the GABA that would prevent uh, the up reuptake of the acetylcholine and you constantly get contraction. Being unable to contract, not good, 
but being unable to relax, also not good. So despite the fact that neither of these enter neural tissue directly, the effect of their toxins are at the nervous system level. Looking a little bit more at capsules, as opposed to just the formation of biofilms, these have gigantic capsules. When we've seen our capsule stain, remember it's called a negative stain because the background stains and the cell stains, but the capsule itself does not stain. It repels the stains from sticking to it, and so it's the lack of stain that indicates a capsule is present. And typically, when we're going to get rid of some pathogen, it has surface proteins on it that are antigens that will stimulate our immune system to produce antibodies. So normally, our cell that is producing the antibody, antibodies are actually little fork-shaped chemicals. The antibodies would stick to the antigen that would bring this in to the phagocytic cell and destroy it. Would also signal the rest of the immune system to act on it. However, because the capsule is not only outside the cell wall, it actually coats on top of those antigens and the bacterial cell can either prevent the binding of the antibody to the antigen because the capsule is a gooey layer and we can't get binding, or the bacteria might actually produce protease, an enzyme that breaks down proteins. Antibodies are proteins, and so the protease just destroys the antibody, and if it's not its perfect little fork, it can't carry out its role. This is showing two types of uh, antigen changes in influenza viruses. Influenza viruses are RNA viruses and their genome is segmented, meaning they have multiple pieces of RNA as their genome. We don't call them chromosomes because they aren't organized like chromosomes in either prokaryotic or eukaryotic cells and they're made out of RNA, they're not DNA. Influenza viruses also have these two very important proteins on their surface called neuraminidase and hemagglutinin that are important for binding to and entry of their host cells. If there is some sort of um, effect that mutates in the RNA genome that changes the hemagglutinin it used to be a little round lollipop and now it's a blobby lollipop. That is a different virus because different shaped protein will be a different antigen. Those antibodies have a little fork shape that fits exactly and specifically to an antigen. So if the antigen changes, the antibodies made to this hemagglutinin are not very likely to work against that hemagglutinin. So that's called antigenic drift. Within one virus, a mutation occurred in the genome. A change in the genome did result in a change in the protein. That would be a missense mutation, but it didn't inactivate the virus. It's still happy and fine. And that means if I breathed in virus A, and while it was replicating in me, it had a mutation, and then I cough out virus B, it's a totally different virus. It is why one reason why the flu vaccine changes every year. The flu vaccine you had last year is not likely to protect you this year because as it has spread through the population across the world, we've had antigenic drift. We can also have antigenic shift. That happens if two different viruses infect the same host cell and while they're in there infecting and then reassembling they just sort of pick and choose pieces from a and b and recombine them 
into a new combination of segments. Individual segments don't cross over and recombine, but we've got the three, what, four biggest segments from this virus and the other segments from that virus, and that means we have the neuraminidase from virus A and the hemagglutinin from virus B, and that means we have a new combination of antigens. If you've heard some influenza viruses described as like H1N1 or H1N5, the H stands for hemagglutinin and the N stands for neuraminidase. The swine flu that came through in 2009 was H1N1, and that particular combination hadn't been seen before in the human population, and that's why we had, I believe, without rounding the numbers, I read the stats recently, around 60 million people were infected in the U.S. between 2009 and 2010 with the H1N1 influenza. There were around 275,000 hospitalizations from that influenza and around 13,000 deaths. The range goes from around 10,000 to around 16,000, the average around 12,000 deaths. So definitely horrific. Definitely more could have been done. We probably should have been wearing masks in 2009, but that's why it spread because it was a novel, a new combination of the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. And that happens from antigenic shift. Two viruses come together, recombine which pieces of what virus get in there, and we have whole new combinations of H and N that hadn't been seen before. That's a very brief, even though it took me, what, 37 minutes and three seconds to do, ways that microbes can get into us, cause us problems. We'll talk about the immune system, and then we're going to get into diseases by body system. And I chose a textbook that organized diseases that way because the ways that pathogens have to invade or get into a particular body system are going to be similar, whether it's bacteria or a eukaryotic pathogen or a virus, the things they're going to have to overcome and how they're going to get around our defenses will be similar within a body system.